There's outrage over parole being dished out to sex attackers who got life sentences and should be dying in prison. We speak to Glynis Gretenbach, the Democratic Alliance's Shadow Minister for Justice. Welcome, Glynis. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Glynis, may we start with a case of Alison Buita? Um, I'm sure you are fully familiar with that. Uh, her attackers were already on parole when they attacked her, stabbed her 37 times, raped her, slit her throat. When they were sentenced to life, the judge recommended that they should never get parole. Yes. They served less than 30 years, they're out on parole, and Alison was not even consulted. Right, it's, a, it's an absolute, absolute disgrace. And it just confirms again that, and I know this is going to sound like a political argument and it's not, uh, it's an absolute disgrace. It confirms the fact that the ANC, and more particularly the Minister of Justice, just do not get it, and they do not care. And he can't even use the excuse of youth or inexperience. He's a he's a practicing attorney. He practiced law before he became the Minister of Justice. He, I granted he's a young man, and so you know one makes room for, uh, for perhaps uh, mistakes. But just a few weeks ago, we had the Tarbo Bester debacle, where Bester mm-hmm. escaped from prison. Uh, pretended to be dead, and on the best case scenario for the criminal justice cluster, they knew by the the July, at the best case, probably earlier, but at the best for them, by July of that year, they knew that the corpse in the cell was not that of Bester. They knew that Bester had escaped from prison, that he was roaming around, living his best life, as it happens, living in Hyde Park, shopping at Thrupp's, and they did nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing to investigate the escape, to get him apprehended, but more importantly, to warn his victims, to warn them and offer them some sort of support and protection that he was at large. They did nothing. They left those survivors of rape, those people who have already been victimized beyond contemplation, they left them out there, vulnerable, uninformed and alone. And when we confronted them in Parliament, in our inquiry from my committee, with those facts, the best that the minister could do was look mildly, mildly chastised, not even horrified, mildly chastised, and say, uh, yes, we should have done better and we apologize. Now, that simply isn't good enough. So that happened. Then, a couple of weeks later, he releases on parole these two thugs that attacked uh, Alison Berger. Bearing in mind, the Tabo Besser thing is fresh in his memory. The whole of South Africa is already cross with him about this issue. The fact that not only didn't they do their job, not only did they not try and apprehend him, not only did they not investigate this case, but they did not do anything to protect the victims. And that's there. It must be in his mind every time he goes to bed at night. would be in mind. And he does it again. Weeks later, he does it again. He releases these two thugs on parole without so much as the buy your leave to Alison Werther. The judge in that matter said that if the death penalty still existed, he would have imposed it. That's how seriously he felt about what they had done. As you said, they stabbed this woman Two of them, two grown, big, bully boy men, stabbed her 37 times, slit her throat, raped her, and left her for dead. She crawled along in the felt, holding her own head up so that it didn't fall off her body. And so she came to a, a dirt road where she couldn't crawl any further and lay there in the dirt, cradling her head so that it didn't fall off. She was rescued by a man who drove past. And who stops in this day and age? Saw her move and he went back. Not only, he was, a, 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 he was studying to be a vet. So not only did he have some medical knowledge, he stopped, he helped her. He got her into his car without killing her. 
got her to hospital where by some miracle she survived. He stayed with her. They became lifelong friends. He changed the direction of his study to become a doctor. He was there when her children were delivered much later. It's an incredible story of what he did. He's a hero. Alison Werther is, is an absolute phenomenon. Not only did she have the strength to drag herself through the filth and keep her wits about her while her head was quite literally falling off her neck, she survived. She's managed to make a life, to have a family. But of course, she's a victim and she's going to remain traumatized forever. This is not the kind of thing you forget. And then to have these people threatening her from in prison, because they did, to have them released on parole without even, not only not informing her, not consulting her, not considering her views, is so callous. Beyond a measure, there, I have no words, well, no words that you can say on radio anyway. And, and this is what the, the, the Minister of Justice thinks is acceptable behaviour. In, in a year where Parliament has passed, under great pressure, my committee sat nights, we sat at night, we sat on Saturdays to get the gender-based violence slate of legislation through Parliament. We worked on it under so much pressure. We spent so much time on it. Not just me, it's not, it's not, a, it's the entire committee, all the members of the committee, from all the different political parties on that committee. We all spent hours and hours and hours on it. We spent, we sat at night after Parliament roads. We sat on Saturdays to get that legislation passed through Parliament. And what does he do? In the face of gender-based violence, we have the highest rate of gender-based violence in the world. And what does our Minister of Justice do? Doesn't give a damn. Well, at the, just uh, in the same month, I think, um, uh, on per another case involving parole of a sex attacker uh, was that of a station strangler. He was yeah. also supp supposed to serve yeah. a life sentence and um, he was released to outrage from the community. Yes. I understand there's a price on his head. Sure. Uh, he's supposed to be under house arrest. Um, and uh, now the police have responsibility to try and, and, and keep him contained in some manner so that he doesn't uh, attack another child. So that's just a joke. So, I mean, we all understand that, uh, you know, the rule of law applies to everybody and that when you go to prison, you uh, fall under a certain regime and there are from time to time uh, regulations passed and, and uh, remissions made and we've just seen the ANC give remission to over 10,000 people, you know, just to get Jacob Zuma out of prison. Um, and so uh, there are... There are uh, Systems in place that allow people to qualify for paroles. And when, you, when you're imprisoned, uh, you, you have to do certain things and, and, and that helps you or, or doesn't help you um, get into a, a lane for paroles. So you have to complete certain programs, you have to behave in a certain fashion, you have to demonstrate certain qualities. All of those things are true. And of course, uh, you know, at some point, people are going to be released on parole. Um, that, that is the very nature of being sent to prison. You know, at some point you're going to get out. And so as a society, we can't say people can never get out of prison. I mean, that would be, that would be equally unfair. You, you behave in an antisocial fashion, you're caught, you're investigated, you're arrested, you're tried, and you're sentenced. And once you've served your sentence, uh, you're supposed to notionally have paid your debt to society and you're entitled to be released either completely or because you've served your sentence or on parole because you qualify for parole. And, we, you know, on paper, I have no difficulty with that. It is how the system works and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but when you have outliers like this, the, these two thugs who attacked Alison Werther were on parole, as you correctly stated, when they committed this offence. They demonstrated that they cannot be trusted. They were trusted. They were allowed out on parole. They were allowed to reintegrate into society. And what did they do? That's what they did. Should they get parole again? Absolutely not. Absolutely. There can be no circumstance 
under which they could, should qualify for parole. The judge did say they should never get parole. Yes. He did. He said they should never get parole. But that doesn't always prevent people getting parole. And there's another argument we made up for if I remember cor- if, I, if I remember correctly, Tabo Besta was out on parole when he raped two women. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. These are people who exhibit this type of antisocial behavior that should be viewed with great suspicion and a very you want to Because while they have rights, society also has rights. And we all know that we all have rights in South Africa, but my right to swing my arm ends where your nose begins. And, and that counts for society as well. If somebody's a danger to society, who are you supposed to protect? That one individual? Or the many individuals who are full part of society who are living their lives according to the law, not breaking the law, obeying the law, uh, being uh, an asset to, and contributing to society, or, or this one antisocial being who doesn't know how to behave or refuses to behave. On what basis do you think these people are being released? Just routine parole privileges? Well, you know, um, I've asked for the record of decision in the in the Alison Boucher matter. I haven't even had the courtesy of a reply despite a reminder. And so I've um, sent in a, a, a prior application uh, to get the record of decision because I'd like to see what the minister considered, if anything at all, um, when he made both of these recommendations or when he accepted both of these recommendations for parole. So... Uh, until I get that, I, I, I can't uh, comment on what he considered. Uh, certainly, um, one of the things that you must consider is if if there's going to be a, a, a negative impact on society. In the station strangler matter, you can understand that people are up in arms. Um, it, it, it was a it was a, a big matter. Still, it had to do with children. People's children, you know, were the victims. And those people are never going to get over it. Neither is anyone in their family or their community ever going to get over it. So he comes out of prison already a marked man. Whether he's able to reintegrate or not, he's going to have a lot of trouble because he's, he's released into a society that's hostile, that doesn't want him there. But the big problem is this. Uh, the parole regime in South Africa is completely and utterly broken. So community corrections notionally is supposed to keep tabs on all these parolees, is supposed to supply them with uh, some re- support, supposed to help them reintegrate, um, all of those wonderful things and, and check on them and make sure they're complying. And of course, community correction, just like everything else in the criminal justice system is hideously under-resourced and hideously under-capacitated. So um, they, have, they already don't have enough social workers to deal with the people that are currently on parole adding more every day is not helpful it just means the system becomes more broken it just means that their ability to exercise any kind of oversight over the parolees becomes less and less and less so i can guarantee you that if you phone up anybody now today and ask them do they know where the two top uh, where the two uh ellison bester thugs are ellison bester thugs are right now the answer will be no. I can tell you they don't even know where they live. They don't even know what province they're in. And the same goes for the station stranger. Now, you know, it becomes uh, incumbent upon the police to protect the community. If something goes wrong, there's going to be big problems. We've already got the Kwame Shell case, which holds uh, the state liable when, when this type of thing uh, goes wrong. And then both of these things are accidents waiting to happen. And when they do, and I sincerely hope they don't, because that presupposes that some other poor individual is going to be a victim. But if things go wrong, and they probably will, then the minister must understand that he's going to be held liable in his personal capacity. Because he should have foreseen that this type of thing can go wrong, horribly wrong. And the whole of society is more important than individuals. And the process, in my view, was not followed. The community for the Station Strangler was not consulted. They've released him into a community. The best case scenario for him, if his intentions are entirely noble, if he is rehabilitated in prison by some unbelievable miracle, 
and he comes out only wishing to do good. He has been released into a society that does not want him. And you can't blame them, and it's not going to change. People are, people are only human. The same with the Arison Buddha thugs. Even if they've come out, and we know they haven't because they've been issuing threats from, from within prison, and members of their family opposed the release on parole, said, we don't want them either. And yet they were still released. So they too have been re released into an environment that is hostile. They don't want them. They're already seriously limited to choices. Even if you come out in the unlikely event that you come out with the very best of intentions. Uh, this, the environments in which those people have been released is also, and it's going to make their reintegration, if that's at all possible, into society almost impossible. And so it's an excellent way, Jim Thank you. Thank you. That was Glynis Breitenbach, the Democratic Alliance's Shadow Minister for Justice, speaking to Biz News about paroles being dished out to sex attackers who got life sentences and should be dying in prison. Thank you, Glynis. Thank you.